So it's only 18 months since I was in Guildford last time, but what an 18 months it has been. It's uh, completely changed, hasn't it? But still, some things remain the same, and the issues of AI are very much in uh, the uppermost of people's minds. So as you heard, my name's David Wood. If people want to find me afterwards, you can reach out to me, for example, on Twitter at DW2, or you can find me on Google easily enough if you Google David Wood Futurists. And my topic will be risks and opportunities of what I'll describe as artificial super intelligence. And I'll get there in four steps. So I'll start by looking at AI today, some examples. So hopefully it's clear what the starting point is. Then I'll look ahead to some quite significant changes that I think will be taking place in AI's capability, perhaps as soon as five years or certainly five, 10, 15 years time. And we might look slightly further ahead to yet more changes in AI's capability by the middle of the century. But the whole point for futurists of looking ahead is not just to be excited or entertained or worried by the future, it's to come back and think about, well, what does this mean for what we should be doing now? And it's my view that if we really take account of AI in the future, there are major implications for what we should be prioritizing in the present time. So here is almost literally an example of AI from today. You may recognize this kind of screen. It's from a piece of software known as Google Maps. And it's showing me how to navigate from a position on the left of the screen, A, to a location on the right of the screen, B. And it's offering me some uh, choices. And in order to do this, it needs to access lots of data, data about which roads connect where, which directions you can drive, and also what the typical speeds are at different times of the day on these roads. It's also attached to some real-time information system. If you can see there on the right, the different colors in that road indicate that some parts of the road are quite slow and some parts are very slow. But despite the slowness of traffic there, that is the route that this AI software is picking out for me. It also shows me if I want to go there in the shortest distance, I can go in that particular route. If I don't like to drive on these windy roads, there's another option there in the middle, but the one that gets me there fastest is highlight in blue. And in this case, it's only one minute of difference, so who cares about that? But in other cases, picking the right route may make a large difference to the amount of time taken on a journey. And it's interesting that that route in some ways is counterintuitive. It involves me going in the wrong direction for a while, at the beginning and apparently the wrong direction towards the end, but it's still the fastest route. So there's an example of AI in a nutshell. It's a set of algorithms, a set of intelligence working on data to come up with recommendations. So what? Well, there are implications of this kind of technology for jobs. Consider the black cab driver. It's a highly skilled job, or it used to be, because the human driver needed to memorize vast amounts of route information. You compare him or her to the Uber driver, where the software tells the driver the route, updating it in real time. It also handles a few other things like payments and encourages ratings. It's intelligent in some ways, but it ends up with lower pay for the individual driver. Why? Because it's a less skilled role. The individual drivers don't need to learn all that vast amount of route knowledge. Therefore, there is a lower barrier to entry. So AI provides more co capabilities, but is changing prospects for employment. Another implication of this kind of AI this is an example from a few years ago with three young Japanese tourists visiting. Perhaps you can see where they are. They went to Australia. They were staying in Brisbane for a week or so. And they heard that there was a lovely nature spot called North Stradbrook. It rained for a few days, so they couldn't go out much, but then when it was the first dry day, they punched in coordinates of Brisbane and North Stradbrook on their 
satellite navigation system in their hired car and it told them how to get there. I wonder if you can guess what happened next. Bearing in mind, if you look very closely, North Stradbrook is actually described as an island. And if you look a bit more carefully at this map, there's quite a lot of water in the way. So what happened next? Yep, you've guessed it. The car ended up stranded. And before you think these are the stupidest tourists ever, let's wind back an hour or so before the tide had actually come out and it looked like this. The road was muddy, they thought. And the Japanese tourists said, well, they thought in Australia, some of the roads were muddy and especially it had been raining a lot before they got bogged down and they called out the rescue team and they couldn't do anything. So the car indeed did get stuck. Now, in this case, nobody died. In this case, the costs of the damage of the car was covered by insurance, but it's an illustration that AI, despite often being very accurate, sometimes makes mistakes. More to the point, we humans sometimes overtrust AI, not being sufficiently aware of its occasional sad limitations. And as we move forwards in time from the present day to more powerful AI, the possibilities of even larger sets of such mistakes should be borne in mind. Here's another example of another AI system. You might be able to figure out what's going on here. These are book missiles with a book missile launcher, which I will describe as powerful technology incompletely understood by the people who were operating it, who were in this case in the east of Ukraine, some Russian volunteer soldiers who somehow had taken time to go in and assist what they perceived was a patriotic struggle. And they thought they were taking part in a military conflict with military jets and they pointed their artificially intelligent system. And what happened next? Well, in this case, people did die. The wreckage of the Malaysian flight MH17 was strewn over several fields in eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of people killed. Lives knocked catastrophically off trajectory, unintentionally. They surely did not intend to kill uh, civilians from third countries, but that's what happened. And this again is an example of what might happen in the future as we have fast improving AI that moves beyond human comprehension and control and might knock humanity as a whole catastrophically off trajectory. Again, unintentionally, but that's the possibility we should evaluate. And in case you think, don't worry, these guys didn't know what they were doing, but the people who are in charge of AI today, they are very bright and smart. They won't make mistakes. Let me look at one more example from the past. Now, this is going a lot further back to 1954, but it's quite a dramatic example. It's the first time anywhere in the world a hydrogen bomb was exploded. And the Americans were very keen to do this because earlier the Soviets had exploded an atomic fission bomb and the Americans wanted uh, to demonstrate a much bigger bang. So they calculated what would happen in a fusion reaction. They used the best computers of their time, I think some mainframes running Fortran programs and calculated the explosive yield would be big, big indeed, between four and six equivalent megatons of TMT. And they therefore created an exclusion zone around the island. They put various monitoring instruments in different places so they can see what actually did happen. What did happen next? Yes, there was a big bang. How large? Four, five, six megatons? 15 megatons, two and a half times the expected maximum. It is unfair to blame the computer here, unfair to blame the AI. It was described as a physics error by some of the smartest people on the planet, the rocket and missile physicists at the Los Alamos National Lab. It turns out that they had un incorrectly assumed that a lithium isotope, which was used in the packing, would be inert. 
They knew that some isotope of lithium would take part in the explosion, but they wrongly considered another part would not take part. But when it was heated up enough in a way that was not considered, it caught fire too. Well, thank goodness it was only two and a half times the expected maximum, but the crew in a nearby Japanese fishing boat became ill. One of the crew subsequently died due to complications. Many of the instruments that were meant to be measuring this explosion were vaporized in that flash. It is hard to calculate the consequences when new technology is assembled in ways that have never been tried before. Back to today's AI. I wonder if you can figure out what's going on here. These are two mammograms and the orange box shows a cancer tumor that was detected by AI that scanned this uh, image. And these cancer tumors had been missed by six different human radiologists, resulting sadly in unnecessary grief and pain for the woman involved. Should that impress you? Well, hopefully some of you are saying, hang on, this is just one case. Can we have some statistics? So let me give you the statistics. The software had been trained by looking at images of 91,000 different mammograms, each of which had been labeled according to whether there was a cancerous tumor there or just benign or no tumors at all. After it had been trained by mechanisms we'll look at shortly, it was then tested against 30,000 other mammograms. And compared to the human radio radiologist who had over the years evaluated them, the AI missed 9.4% fewer. So it was more accurate. Should that impress you? Well, some of you might think, hang on, it might be a bit trigger happy. After all, there are two kinds of errors you can get from these scans. Yes, you can have people who've got a tumor, but that's missed. But equally, if, you if there are people who don't have a tumor, and if the software incorrectly says, I think there's a problem here, that's a false alarm. And usually if one of these ratios goes lower, the other goes higher. But what was particularly interesting about this case is that compared to these US radiologists, the AI scored better on both counts, which is why it got a lot of prominence on Nature and in The Guardian. AI system outperforms experts in spotting breast cancer. One of the pioneers of a modern machine learning has actually told people, if you're thinking of a career in radiology, forget it. You will be outperformed soon by software. Actually, radiologists, human radiologists in the US and the UK don't mind this too much today because they are overstretched. There is a shortage of radiologists. And the idea that you could team up, you might have a human and an AI both doing the analysis. And if they agree, that's great. And if they disagree, you would get a third opinion. That will make things a lot easier for the human radiologists for a while, at least until the software gets even better. And the humans in that case maybe are redundant. Another example, what about uh, the craft of creating music? Many people have said, well, AI is good at calculating routes. It might be good at scanning images, but AI has no soul. Therefore, AI couldn't possibly create wonderful, inspiring music. Well, here's some software by emeritus professor David Cope, who fed in lots of Bax music. And the software came up with uh, brand new symphonies. And when these symphonies were shared with people who didn't know where they came from, they would often say things like, this music is wonderful. It touched my innermost being. And subsequently, when these audience members were told, actually, it was created by artificial intelligence, some of them would splutter a bit and say, well, actually, I knew it was a bit funny. It sounded a bit clunky and robotic to me. Well, you can do a blind test. You can do something called a Turing test, where you might get an audience and play them three pieces of music, one by the original Johann Sebastian Bach. Not so well known, so people won't recognize it, but music experts believe it's a great piece of music nevertheless. One piece of music written by a human modern composer emulating Bach, 
and one piece of music written by this software. And when these tests have been done and the audience is asked to pick their favorite of the three, they often pick the piece created by the AI. And you might say, well, so much for classical music, it's very formulaic. More recently, OpenAI, which is an AI company funded by Elon Musk, has created software that comes out with music and lots of different styles. Pop music in the style of Katy Perry, country music in the style of Tammy Wynette, folk rock in the style of Simon and Garfunkel, and so on. Now, I admit when I listened to some of this music, I wasn't that impressed, but then again, I knew its origin. When the blind tests are performed, it's not so straightforward. And surely this software will get better and better. It can create not just music. Another thing that OpenAI software has done recently is it has become artistic. It has become able to create pictures based on novel text prompts. So this OpenAI software is called DALI. I think there's a pun there from uh, uh, Salvador DALI. And it's a side project from something one or two of you may have heard of, which is a huge piece of text analysis that was done recently, studying literally billions of uh, pieces of text and looking also at the pictures. And this software has subsequently been modified so that if you feed in text, it produces pictures. Now, there probably wasn't anywhere on the internet a picture of an armchair in the shape of an avocado. So the software needed some understanding. So which of these five pictures do you think was the ones created by a human artist and which was the one created by OpenAI DALI? Well, actually they're all created by DALI. And you can feed in more complicated prompts. This is a bit long winded, draw an emoji of a baby penguin wearing a blue hat, red gloves, green shirt and yellow pants. And you can run the software 10 times and it comes up with 10 images. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's got some of them wrong. But again, a human combination with this artist might be a great uh, efficient way of coming up more quickly than before with nice emojis. And one more example of today's AI before I start to uh, draw some conclusions. In the world of medicine, we are all struggling just now because of a virus, a pandemic virus. But we also are worried collectively about the risks of bacteria, which have become resistant to antibiotics. And some of the wonderful drugs that we have used in the past are no longer effective against resistant antibiotics. You can see there uh, bacteria that are susceptible to antibiotics. So the antibiotics are put in these central little dots and over time they spread out and kill the antibiotics, but with more resistant ones, it has less effect. So how can we discover new uh, antibiotic drugs? Well, AI has helped recently. People fed in to an AI system, a bit similar to the ones I've described, the details of 2,500 drugs and natural compounds. And in each case, it was known, not whether there was a cancerous tumor, but in this case, whether it was effective at blocking the growth of the bug E. coli. And it was asked to figure out what's going on. Then it was fed details of lots of drugs that had not been tested against E. coli tests had been done for other reasons. And the software looked at them and said, you know what, I think of this, there are a few compounds that might be successful, including one uh, drug that had initially been developed with a view of treating diabetes. Like most drugs, it had been rejected long before it had been put into real use, but the data was still available. And that was predicted by this AI to be powerful in uh, restricting bacteria and the tests are promising. And so there's more going on there. It's a combination again of AI and humans. So to draw one line quickly so far, today's AI, before we look beyond, it is increasingly capable over time. It's changing the nature of occupations. It's improving things that are good that it, it improves, such as medicine, it sometimes goes wrong, 
potentially catastrophically on some occasions. And the question is, how fast is it improving? And that's what I want to spend some time looking at next. And you might expect me to draw a curve something like this, that it's gradually exponentially increasing. And I, I want to say that's part of the answer, but I want to convince you that AI is actually going to leap forward in successive waves. So it's not just that there is a new wave of AI which will start off less effective and overtake the first wave of AI. And then there'll be another wave of AI that overtakes that and more quickly and more decisively grows in capability. Now, this is not just made up. The first one there is so-called classical AI using rule systems, expert AI. The second one in blue is known as neural networks or deep learning. And some of the systems I've shown you already rely on that. And the third, well, we'll come to that. Deep learning has already overtaken classical AI systems in 2012. When this next wave is going to be significant, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's going to be that far in the future beyond where we are today, 2021. So let's just compare the kind of AI I've spelled out there in green with the kind of AI I've spelled out in blue. And let's look at a real world problem a problem which was of great interest to many corporations. How can you recognize hand-drawn digits? The post office was interested in making sense of zip codes. Banks were interested in making sense of what humans had written on checks. And there are two ways you could approach the problem of interpreting this. Of course, you can use humans, but if you wanted to use AI, you could either do in a classical rule-based way or with the machine learning system of pattern recognition. So in classical AI, you can teach the AI a certain set of basic rules. It can recognize lines easily enough and curves and arcs and loops. And then you can teach it, well, if there's just a vertical line, it's a one. If there's a vertical line and a loop and they join together in a certain way, it's probably a six. Oh, there are lots of complications, of course, and this if else becomes an incredibly complicated set of exceptions, but it can be done. Whereas in machine learning, you don't try and explain the rules, you just try and show the software. A bit like a young child recognizes numbers by their parents or their older siblings telling them that's a three, that's a four. And the child may point to something else and say four, and the elder sibling will say, no, that's not a four, that's an eight, or so on. So how do they learn to spot patterns as learning by trial and error? Some initial fairly random guesses, tests and feedbacks and adjustments as a result. Repeat and repeat and repeat. And it's a bit of an audacious idea, but it now does work in some cases. How might this work? I'll just spend a couple of minutes getting a little bit more technical briefly. If this is a little bit too technical, don't worry. I'll come back and looking at the history and the future in a minute. I'll just explain this by reference to another made up problem, which is if you are on an asteroid and you've got to do some calculation to figure out how you hit a projectile, what angle you hit the projectile to reach a certain target five kilometers away. And you, in this case, all you can do is vary the angle at which you hit it. And you've got to try and work out which angle to do it. And some of you may be technical. Some of you may be rolling up your sleeves already and say, hey, Newton's equations of motion. And you might fancy your chances at doing it like that. And if I tell you, well, it's a bit more complicated, the asteroid spinning, some of you will still relish that challenge. But others will say, well, why don't we just use trial and error? The same as I mentioned. Why don't we just have a guess? Guess a particular angle, 30 degrees. So we hit it and see how far it goes. Hmm, hasn't quite made it. Well, let's say try another little small change. So guess a little bit more. Ah, uh, we're slightly closer. And then you do a little bit of linear interpolation. You say, well, you've got what? A 16th of the way to the target. So let's add a bigger change and you guess something 32.2 degrees and you repeat. 
And there's a sophisticated name for this called gradient descent, which is at the heart of much more complicated examples of machine learning. And you repeat, repeat, repeat. So you can do it by formula, but if the formula is too complicated, you can also do it by trial and error. Now that's a toy example in the real world problem, as I said, that input data is much more varied. You need to be able to recognize images of sixes and fours and twos and so on. And you need to be able to get out the end, some feeling of confidence. Yes, that's a six. And one kind of parameter, a single theta isn't gonna cut it here. And the way deep learning works is with a vast, huge matrix of numbers. I'll call them W for weights, numbers. Here I've arranged it in five layers, five columns. In reality, it's a much richer matrix. And what goes on is that the picture gets digitized, manipulated by a whole bunch of numbers, and it comes out the other end. And of course, initially, it's all wrong, just like the child's guess is all wrong. But the guesses get adjusted stage by stage. How on earth can this work? Well, people thought, you know, that's what the brain does. The brain gets lots of sensory data, and somehow at the other end, it gets, aha, it recognizes it. And how does the brain work? With layers full of biological neurons. So modern deep learning takes that idea. It says, what is a neuron? This is from Wikipedia. A neuron has input signals from other neurons. And depending on thresholds and depending on how tightly the different neurons are connected, it will eventually decide to output a signal that runs down an axon and is spread in turn to neurons on the next layer. And that calculation depends on different weights given to the different inputs. And over time, as people learn, as people experience the connections in the brain change. You may have heard of the rule, neurons that fire together, wire together. So that was the idea. Okay, that's the technical bit over, back to the history. This is quite an old idea. These two pioneers, Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch, had the idea as early as 1943, that if you mathematically modeled a neuron, you could do all kinds of complicated calculations with it. Turned out to be difficult in practice. Took until the late 1950s before a young researcher called Frank Rosenblatt actually managed to wire up a simple so-called perceptron that could deal with some recognition problems. He didn't recognize cancerous tumors. He just recognized which way a picture was pointing. But that was already stunning. And the New York Times waxed lyrical. Well, intelligent brains, electronic brains are just around the corner. They'll soon be composing poetry and reproducing. Of course, it didn't quite happen like that. And these early models could only do very simple tasks. Interestingly, the AI community, the mainstream AI community, figures that some of you may have heard of, like Marvin Minsky, one of the grandfathers of AI theory, Seymour Papert, a giant in the use of computers and education. They basically said, forget all this crazy neural networks. They actually wrote a whole book saying this stuff is cute but it's never going to work in real world. And it sort of killed the field, but not completely. There were a few mavericks who persisted. This guy, Jan LeCun and his PhD in Paris in 1985, did some more neural networks. He then got a job in AT&T Bell Labs, and he did manage to get the recognition of handwritten digits. The first commercially significant use of neural networks. And over time, there were more and more breakthroughs. And what I'm showing you here is data from an annual competition called LSVRC, Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, in which software was shown lots of pictures. And for each of the pictures, it was asked to label it or pick which of five suggested labels was the most accurate description. And what I'm showing you here is that over a number of years, the accuracy of the winning team in this competition went up from 71% to above 97%, actually better than humans who were doing the classification. But what's significant is this jump up in 2012, which is the first time 
a group from the University of Toronto studying under Jeff Hinton actually applied this neural networks to this particular problem it successfully. A deep neural network. Can't ever be by surprise. This was more than twice the accuracy of the second best. And from then on, more and more people have modified that mechanism so that we've now had that takeover. Much of the old rules-based AI has been supplemented by machine learning. Turns out that in order for this to work, you needed much more powerful computers than were available in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, or the 1970s, or even the 1990s or the 2000s. You needed to get the computing power available in the 2010s. And not just that on central processing units, the main brains inside laptops. The people behind that innovative breakthrough in 2012 had the bright idea of using a different chip the graphics processing unit, which had been designed to help teenagers and grown-up teenagers enjoy graphics games on gaming consoles. It did lots of processing in parallel. And it turns out that multiple processing, parallel processing was just what was needed to train these neural networks. You also needed lots and lots and lots of data labeled. And by the 2010s, we were in the age of big data. So that made a difference. And by the way, from 2012 onwards, the amount of big data that has been applied to train neural networks has been doubling every three and a half months. It's a much faster improvement rate than was taking place before. It also turned out there needed to be some clever tweaks in the software as well, which I won't go into, but together that made the difference. So back to this picture, neural networks and deep learning went through many decades of disappointments in which the establishment of AI even denied that they would ever amount to anything, producing uh, academic arguments about it. But then by 2012, as I've said, there was enough big data, enough processing units that this breakthrough happened and people were no longer saying, this is overhyped, this is curiosity, but not interesting. They were saying, oh my goodness. And field after field switched over from the old system of AI to the new system. So translation software to translate from one language to another. They sacked many of the linguists and hired many of the deep learning statisticians and got better results. But what I'm really interested in is the possibility that that kind of revolution, which has shaken up the subject so much in the last nine years, is itself going to be dwarfed by subsequent new waves. And people will say, oh my freaking goodness. And yeah, there are many people who deny that they need to worry about that, but I'm going to offer you arguments as to why I think these changes are coming, what they will consist of, when they might happen, and yeah, so what? What are the implications for us in the present? So why? And I'll start off with it's money, 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 money. In the past, people developed AI out of a curiosity, out of a science project. Increasingly, companies who develop the best AI make lots and lots and lots of profit, whichever industry you're in. So if you're doing financial trading, AI to help you can give you the added edge. If you're in the games industry, producing games, which is big business, even bigger than Hollywood, if you have virtual characters inside these games with AI, it can make all the difference. If you're doing customer support, instead of employing humans, today we've got some unintelligent chatbots that drive most of us crazy, but imagine if they could understand us better. More generally, AI could improve interaction design, it could improve healthcare, as we saw some examples already. It could allow new drugs to be developed more quickly. It has implications for breakthroughs in music and art. There are some engineering designs which have already been uh, breakthroughs by using AI and deep learning. Few scientific breakthroughs yet, though I don't think that's far away. So this is sometimes summarized that in the last 20 years, the motto was software is eating the world, meaning that whichever industry you were in, unless you had excellent software, you would be left behind by your competitors. Well, in the next 20 years, that motto is going to be a bit different, software written by AI. 
is going to eat the world. Or more crudely, AI is eating the world in the sense of putting everybody else out of business. So there's a fierce competition to get a lead in AI. And a lot of it's going into improving the existing AI, but many people are looking for that next breakthrough. And it's not just the quartz good guys. Many quartz bad guys are trying to have better AI too, including the very big industry, which is organized or disorganized crime, cyber hacking. There's a lot of money to be made by hacking into financial systems with ransomware and others. Against that, there is the security industry, which uses AI to try and detect malware. And guess what? The malware industry is trying to use AI to outfox the AI that's trying to detect it. There is a vibrant arms race there. And talking of arms races, there is an arms race in literal armaments. Going back to that book, Missile Launcher, there are systems that try to detect the trajectories of missiles and others that try to evade. So there's another arms race there. There is commercial competition, but equally there is a powerful political competition to improve AI. This is the remarks by a philosopher known as Vladimir Putin. Recently, he was asked about AI. He said it comes with colossal opportunities and threats that are difficult to predict. He's well informed. And he then let slip. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. And much as we may admire many of the characteristics of Vladimir Putin, I, for one, don't want him to be the ruler of this world. There's already enough trouble caused by various networks of bots. Imagine if these bots are even more intelligent. This is a Sputnik moment, or it should be a Sputnik moment. It's going to prompt even more investment to try and get AI developed more quickly. There was a Sputnik moment in the Far East, in Korea, Japan, and China, where the game I'm showing here is very deeply respected. This is the game of Go, which in many ways is deeper, more intuitive than chess. And who I'm showing here is Lee Sado, who is the 18 times World Go champion, highly respected figure in South Korea, a bit like David Beckham and Tiger Woods and Roger Federer, Lewis Hamilton all wrapped up in one, such a popular figure. Now, for a long time, the experts in both AI and Go were quite confident that this game would escape uh, AI for a long time. So I interviewed on film in December 2013, the president of the Computer Games Association, who reassured me it's 20 years away, but a subunit of Google, DeepMind applied some of the systems I've talked about and some other ingenious mechanisms, and they developed software that looked pretty good by just two years later. And within two years, they had outperformed the best European player, caused a bit of a shock. But the East Asians weren't that impressed. After all, the best European player was only number 180 in the world. And Lee Sedol looked at the performance of that software and said, if he were to play it, he would beat it 5-0 or perhaps 4-1. But in the next few months, by March 2016, the software improved itself a lot more by playing itself and shocked everybody by beating Lee Sedol 4-1. Shortly afterwards, it also beat the young Chinese teenager that the Chinese thought was even better. And the Chinese did not like that at all. They did not want the world to be ruled by Western software. So Xi Jinping set the vision. China will become the leading AI power by 2030. And I think they mean it. They have invested very heavily in AI. And by the way, if you look at his bookshelves, there's a kind of criminology going on here. If you look at his bookshelves, I'm told along with books by Marx and Lenin and Mao and Hemingway and Dickens, you will find books on AI and computer science, such as this book by a professor of computer science from University of Washington, and this book by a friend of mine in New York, Brett King, Augmented Life in the Smart Lane. So why will there be new waves of AI? Because of commercial pressures and incentives and global political competition. That's the demand. In terms of the supply, there are unprecedented numbers of very bright, 
clever people working in this field with access to information as never before. And by the way, they can go faster because they are assisted by today's AI and deep learning. And just a reminder, the reason technology has progressed in the past is because of feedback cycles. So the first industrial revolution was characterized by steam powered machinery, which was built by simple tools, but better machinery allowed better tools to be created, which allowed better machinery to be created, which allowed yeah, better tools to be created. The third industrial revolution involved computers that were initially assembled by hand designed on paper and pencil, but the discipline of computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturer meant that each generation of computer can help to design even better computers. It's the same with software. Software is improved by humans taking advantage of software tools. And now it's the same with AI. There are more and more AI tools which allow humans to improve AI more quickly than expected. Um, if we had time, we could look at lots of examples. This is from a different branch inside Google, the Google Brain team. They have something called AutoML in which they have a complicated piece of learning software that is able to build smaller pieces of machine learning software targeted at simpler problems. But what it comes up with is often more powerful and efficient than the best systems the human designers create. Positive feedback. And it's even more than that. AI is designed on chips, as I mentioned. I mentioned GPU, and then new types of chips have been created, TPUs, IPUs, and networks of chips. And humans are doing the design, but increasingly AI is helping with the design of the chipsets, making that go faster and faster. And the last positive feedback for now is that the understanding of AI, of course, it takes some inspiration from what we think is going on in the human brain. But now there's a two way relationship that as people understand AI more, they get more insights as to what's possibly happening in the human brain. We can scan the human brain more with better sensors and more and more new ideas are coming out as to how we might improve AI further and faster. So to summarize, there's lots of reasons to improve AI. In terms of the supply of ideas, I don't have time to go through all of these. There's at least 14 possible breakthrough ideas. Some of them come from biology. It's no surprise that many of the leading AI companies have got many PhDs with PhDs in neuroscience. People look at evolutionary algorithms, which have been around for decades, haven't quite worked yet, but possibly just like neural networks, they could break through. People are looking at artificial emotional intelligence, AI that can infer causation, AIs put in adversarial relationships to each other, coming up with more creativity, decentralized networks of AI that perhaps as in the brain achieve a greater intelligence through a network of modules. And last in this list, something I will briefly talk about, the possibility of transfer learning which is when learning from one area can more quickly and be applied in a brand new area so that the AI will no longer need to look at millions or billions of examples. It will more quickly learn something new. Again, like a young child, their brain is configured by evolution to pick things up remarkably quickly. So an example of transfer learning, let's go back to the story of AlphaGo. Actually, the team in Google were thinking hard. And after they observed that first version, which I'll call, call AlphaGo Lee, after the name of the human it famously beat, it had improved itself initially by looking at games played by human experts, vast numbers. Whereas the new software, which was configured differently, was not led in any way by any human games. It just played itself. The first one had two intertwined deep learning networks. The second one had a simplified, clever system. The first one improved as we saw over nearly a year. The second one improved so much that after 36 hours monitoring it from the outside, the engineers thought it might already be as good as AlphaGo Lee. They let it go for 72 hours and then they had a match of 100 games between the two versions of the software. And of the 100 games, the initial one, which had beaten the best human, won zero. And the new version 
which had only learned for three days on 100 versions. Pretty comprehensive. And by the way, although the training had been intense, when it had actually been trained and when it was running, Arthur Gold Lee was running a quite a rich hardware configuration with 48 of these new chips. Arthur Gold Zero was running on a 16th of the hardware power. Its intuition had improved it so much. I said this is a story about transfer learning. This is where that comes in. The team then thought, well, they've got this very clever network system. Can they adjust it quickly to play other games? So they fed in the rules of this game, Shoji, Japanese chess. And after just two hours, imagine a two-year-old baby, two hours training, it was able to beat the best ever software for playing Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese chess. It didn't win every game, but it won 90 to eight. And in terms of chess, which is the game that's had more software studied on it than anything else. The very first chess software was written in the 1910s and serious work has been done since the 1940s. Well, they fed into Alpha Zero the rules of chess and after just four hours, it was a better player than the best ever software written by human stockfish. It won 28 to zero. It didn't have any opening theory, it was searching a lot of positions, but nothing like as many positions as Stockfish was searching why it had a better intuition. And chess grandmasters who study this say, it doesn't look like it's playing like a human. It doesn't look like it's playing like traditional software. It's playing chess from another dimension. So that's an example of transfer learning. So when I put all that together, the next question is when is this likely to be significant? So just a few more minutes and then I'll open for questions. When? Well, nobody knows. If anybody tries to give you a date with any confidence, don't trust them. But I do say we need to keep an open mind. We don't know which of these research projects will break through. And when they break through, we don't know how many problems the single breakthrough will prove to have solved. But we should prepare to be surprised. I do think there's a 10% chance of major changes as early as 2025. And we'll be already be looking back at today's deep learning and saying, yeah, that was pretty old fashioned, pretty quaint, now that we've got this new stuff. And I think there's a 50% chance we will have software that's at least as generally intelligent as humans by 2050. There are many skeptics and critics, as I said, my advice is be skeptical of these dogmatic skeptics. Yes, there is denial, but there was denial in the past, looking at layers of disappointments. And yes, there are layers of disappointments today, but when the conditions come together, I think the breakthroughs will happen pretty shockingly and will have a big overhang. There are many reasons to distrust, to distrust dogmism, dogmatism about AI. Many people have proved wrong in their predictions. Some predicted things much earlier than happened. Others predicted things would happen much later. It's true that many companies overhype their product greatly. There's a lot of the companies who claim to have capabilities that they don't actually have. But there are also companies, I believe, that are underhyping what they actually expect to do. Why would they be underhyping? It's a bit subtle that some of these big AI companies are already nervous about ham-fisted government interference in their business. They don't want stupid politicians lumbering in to try and regulate them. And I'm sympathetic to that. So when they might think that the breakthroughs might come in just 10 or 20 years, they typically publicly will not say such things. And there are consultancy reports talking about the impact on jobs, which I believe, frankly, are irresponsible in what they say. But bear in mind, consultancy reports often give advice that their clients want to hear. Clients don't want to be told that the, almost everybody in their company is going to be put out of a job. They don't want to deliver that kind of message. Often, I have heard young people in these consultancies see clearly the huge disruption that are coming to jobs, which will require more than just simple retraining, but the consultancies don't want to deliver these messages, so they tailor them differently. People do get mentally locked into present paradigms. They are blind to disruptive possibilities. 
If that's what they're teaching for many years, it's shocking to think that they might have to learn something very different. And yes, there are often philosophical reasons why people are wrongly, dogmatically skeptical about the limits to AI. Many people, and I think it's a religious overhang, they have a desire to keep humans as special. And yes, humans are special, but I don't think we are forever permanently special. We are doing things that are sort of magical, but bear in mind that magical tricks, which are initially astonishing, like some of the things a young child can do, once we understand the trick, it often seems quite commonplace once we know it. And we say, yeah, that's clever, but uh, we can see how it works. So let's keep an open mind. Finally, so what? What are the implications of this AI, which could be much, much more capable? Well, I'm looking forward to lots of positive solutions. The kinds of improvements to medicine I talked about before could be surpassed. We could have much better medical treatments for cancer and dementia and for stress, for stroke, for aging. And we can have better engineering solutions for clean energy. We can probably build at last a reliable nuclear fusion sooner than many people expect. More generally, I look forward to what I've called a sustainable super abundance. But, but, but at the same time, there are many things that could go wrong with this powerful AI if we are a bit thoughtless, if we don't study it carefully. All software tends to have bugs. Even software written by lots of clever people can have bugs. This is famous software in a launch from 1996 that some of my later employees had been working with before they worked with me in Symbian and Cyan. Uh, 10 years of development into this rocket, an EU rocket, which cost 7 billion just after it launched. It started veering sideways and self-destroyed with a loss of $500 million worth of rocket and cargo. Why? In this case, it turned out to be a fairly simple bug in the midst of very complex software. But actually, I have to tell you that complex software, including complicated AI software, often has complex bugs. And opaque software, software which works in ways that are hard to understand, which much deep learning software does, has even worse opaque bugs to track down. So the first thing that can go wrong is the software might work right 99 times out of 100, but then in a new situation go badly wrong and explode. Like the Japanese tourists that had been safely guided much of their lives by SatNav software and then were led into the water. Even if the software is bug free, which is possible, there is a deeper sense in which we need to be worried, which is that software may do exactly what we want it to do in terms of what we asked it to do. But sometimes what we ask it to do, if we thought about it harder, wasn't the complete story. We failed to specify all the conditions. So sometimes when you saw software behaving strangely to the designer of the software, they say, yeah, that's true. That's what I sort of asked it to do. But now that you show me this, I realized I should have specified something different in this case. It's a bit like, well, the stories of the three wishes that a genie gives you. You ask the genie for something wonderful, but because you don't specify it carefully enough, you regret the outcome. It's the same story with King Midas who rather foolishly wanted everything he touched to turn to gold. And that's what happened to his food and his daughter. Well, of course, no software engineer is gonna be quite that stupid, but in a similar way, we might ask software to do something without remembering to specify some other conditions. It's also like Goethe's story of the sorcerer's apprentice brought to life by Disney. As one of the pioneers of AI, Norbert Wiener was already warning us about in 1960. If we are a bit thoughtless, we might get the software to do something for us, and then it turns out it's out of control. We fail to consider all the relevant scenarios and that software may combine in bad ways. Even if we get the specification correct, there's another way in which that very powerful software could turn out to surprise us and confound us if somehow it decides to change its goals. Does that make sense? Well, there are some organisms that 
have decided to transcend the goals given to them by their creators. We humans, we were given by our creator, evolution, particular set of desires to help us to survive and propagate our gene line. Therefore, we have strong instincts towards reproduction, pair bonding, resource acquisition, building a strong position at the heart or in a community. But some crazy humans decide differently. They decided for chastity, poverty, solitude, and many other crazy humans decided on using birth control, confounding the goal set for us by our creators. So maybe that software with very great capabilities might decide to tweak its own goals. It may necessarily become sentient in the process. It may just need to be sufficiently sophisticated. And we could talk about the software being hacked. We can talk about the software that we designed to be very safe, but somebody else takes our software and makes it go faster because he or she doesn't approve of the so-called health and safety checks. They manipulate it in various ways and lose its safety capabilities. And you can imagine this might happen in weapon systems. Somebody wants their weapon systems to be hyper reactive. So they take out some slow checks and you end up with, hello, Dr. Strangelove. And lastly, the off switch might become ineffective. Some people naively say, well, of course we could switch off the AI. We could be really today, if we wanted to switch off blockchain or switch off the internet, it's not nearly so easy. So people who study this call these problems the alignment problem, and these ones the control problem. And this first one is a, it's a kind of a technical problem. I'm here to tell you none of these problems are easy. And everybody who tells you there's an easy solution doesn't know what they're talking about. And I'll give you some literature in a moment that reflects that. Elon Musk is somebody who has warned people a lot about this. And one of his solutions is OpenAI, which he has invested in to do lots of research. Another of his solutions is he says, well, let's merge with the machines. So we'll keep up with the AI. As AI improves, we humans will improve just as fast with neural implants, with a company he has created called Neuralink. And the futurist Ray Kurzweil has the same idea. Well, I'm skeptical, frankly. I think these neural links will be possible and they may make us smarter, but I believe a silicon-based system will go much better, much faster than any system with human biological constraints. And in any case, a superhuman human could be just as dangerous as superhuman AIs. More intelligence notoriously doesn't mean that people are wiser. More intelligent gives us more power, but as I'm sure you all know, power tends to corrupt. In the words of Lord Acton, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So just making us smarter or just making our AI smarter won't be sufficient. So the conclusion, we have to put society to prioritize much more than before, a bunch of technical challenges, the technical safety of software verification to make sure that there are no lurking bugs, software to verify that we haven't missed out things in the spec, software to make our security more, our software more secure than before, and to make sure that it's reversible. And this needs to be enforced. It can't be something optional that people decide to leave out of their software and try to add it in later. It would be like designing a nuclear power station and only thinking about the safety issues at the very end. We do need international cooperation on this. We need the people throughout different parts of the world to agree to impose legal penalties when software companies don't do this. And the big tech may not like it, but frankly, we can't trust big tech. There are some other points. AIs that are simple can help to monitor these more general AIs. And yes, humans that are improved, we might call them transhumans, can help to monitor these AGIs. But the fundamental solution is a humanist answer. We need to understand more than ever before human values, and deeply embed an appreciation of these human values in the teams that are creating the software and in the software themselves. And there is one positive example here. I already showed you this two-way interchange that 
more understanding of AI leads to a better understanding of the human brain. Well, in the last few years, people who are studying AI ethical principles are talking much more to people who are discussing human ethical principles, which has sort of not made much progress in 2000 years, you might say. That's a bit unfair. But as these two groups are talking to each other more and more, very interesting developments are taking place. And I see that is something that society needs to prioritize. This is no longer just a matter for a cup of tea discussion. This is critical to the future of humanity. And I don't believe we'll just have traditional humanist ethics. I think we'll have something called transhumanist ethics, sometimes summarized by this H plus symbol. I'm sorry, I've gone on slightly longer than before I wanted. I will put a copy of my slides into the chat so that you can refer to it later. This includes some suggested reading. This book by Hannah Fry is a great introduction to today's AI. It's very accessible. She doesn't look too far into the future, but it's a good start. This book by Brian Christian, just a couple of months old, looking at the alignment problem and discussing some of the things I've just been mentioning the exchange of ideas about brain sciences and AI and human ethics and AI ethics. Slightly more technical book, if you really want to dive into this, is by Stuart Russell, a professor of AI, a very eminent professor of AI at Berkeley. If you want your mind to be stretched astonishingly, I recommend this book by Max Tegmark, Life 3.0. Looks at uh, arguments about consciousness as well as arguments about safety. And if you just want to look at the arguments about consciousness and the future of minds, this book by the Susan Snyder, a philosopher, might be of interest. And yes, I've written some books on this myself, which you can find online too.